glad to be back with you again for uh, the fall season of Let's Learn Food Science and I'm so excited to be making videos for you again. I took a little bit of a break this past summer just to take time with my family uh, for a variety of different reasons and uh, it just happened that uh, for a number of reasons my mother got quite ill and I had to adopt all her cats so you might have uh, some videos of cats showing up. It's, it's kind of exciting to do that but uh, I wanted to, to welcome, welcome all of our students, students back. back. Uh, from, from our, our programs, programs at Niagara College, College in the Culinary, culinary Innovation program, program, as well as the friends who have joined us from around the world um, who are engaging with this content as part of their learning process for learning about innovation practice and learning about how to do food science better. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to jump into my PowerPoint here. And today we're going to talk about concepts of hope and where do you get that inspiration for innovation. And talk a little bit about my experience. Uh, this past summer, I had the privilege of being part of a uh, working group with the Thought for Food organization out of Switzerland and the um, Open IDEO, which is an innovation platform um, that brings and connects uh, innovators from around the world, the Rockefeller Foundation and the EAT Foundation. And we've been talking about systems thinking and I am going to be sharing a lot of that systems thinking with you so that you can apply those uh, principles in your own organizations and in your own food science learning. So let's go to the PowerPoint and we will uh, start talking about systems thinking. All right, here we are in the PowerPoint. And as you notice, I always use the same structure. At the end of this video, you will be able to. And this is a practice from what's called competency-based education and training. And I developed some videos over the summer about that topic. The idea being that anything that we're presenting in this video, I want you to be able to turn it into a skill that then you can use to advance your own learning and advance your employment or advance your organization and make it meaningful for you. So at the end of this video, you will be able to reflect on your motivation for being in the agri-food industry. You will appreciate the role of hope in innovation practice. And I know hope might sound wishy-washy or vague or naive, but all innovation really is grounded in hopefulness and optimism. And so I really want to break that down. And what do we mean by hope? And last but not least, we're going to justify the innovation mindset using Christine Gould's toolkit. And as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, Christine Gould is the CEO of the Thought for Food Foundation, and uh, I was very fortunate to be in some workshops with her this summer talking about innovation mindsets, and we'll, we'll walk through some of those tools that she's developed. So, it's an exciting time, actually, and, and it's really fun for me at Niagara College to be bringing a lot of my students along on this journey. The United Nations Food Systems Summit is coming up in September 2021, and it is a people's summit. And what's been really fantastic is they've gathered food industry leaders, food systems leaders, grassroots organizations, community leaders, government leaders, all sorts of people, thousands of people in different dialogue and action groups from around the world. We have come together to collaborate. And I just happened to join the uh, collaborative uh, cohort with the Thought for Food group. Um, because they've been focusing on innovation practice and collective action. Both of these are very uh, key themes to how I do my own work. Um, innovation practice, obviously you're in my innovation course and you're here because of uh, innovation itself, but also collective action. The idea that people should come together with a singular purpose and create that, that unified goal and then work together in their own ways towards that unified goal. That's what collective action is all about. It's being used by trade unions, it's being used by grassroots organizations, and it's now being used by governments as well and large civil sector organizations such as the United Nations. The idea that using the connectivity that the internet age has brought us allows us to create these communities where we can find that collective purpose and work together in, in such unique ways that we couldn't do 10, 15, 20 years ago. So we will be participating in as many of these United Nations Food, uh, food Systems Summit activities as possible. And I'll be sharing lots of links with my 
with my uh, cohort at Niagara College to get you participating. And for those of you out in the community, I hope that you look up the, uh, the summit yourself and find ways that you can participate. Now, as I mentioned before, it's a hopeful time and always at the beginning of the school year. It's, it's the first day of school at Niagara College. I'm always really hopeful and optimistic and and many of my colleagues, you, you just walk around with a big smile on your face. And, and honestly, I'm really happy to be working in such a hopeful industry. Most young people come to college because they have some dream, some goal in their mind to make themselves better, to make their communities better. And that is what's that driving motivation behind wanting to come to college and invest several years and a, and a good chunk of money into becoming something better. Now, what that something better is, is part of the journey. <laughs> you might be a food, food scientist, you might become a, a bus driver, you might become a plumber, an electrician, a, a, a doctor, a dentist. It, it, honestly, there's so many different pathways, but figuring out what motivates you is part of that journey. We've got some other videos to talk about the structures of motivation, but that motivation, I think, is really grounded in a sense of hopefulness that you can make something better of your life. So I had the chance to reflect on um, a book written by Thomas Homer Dixon. I'll, I'll give you the reference for the book in just a moment, but he speaks about the idea of commanding hope. And one of the, one of the terms that he discusses in his, in his uh, thesis is the idea that hope could be a very passive thing. I hope that for my birthday, my spouse gives me uh, a television. I don't know. I don't need a television. I'm just I'm just making something up off the top of my head. But I, I it, it's a very passive thing. I hope that the weather will be good tomorrow. I hope that the Blue Jays will win their next game. I hope that the election party that I want wins the election. It's a very passive thing versus the term I hope to. And that's an important thing. I hope to become a food scientist. I hope to change the world through my video series. <laughs> I'm being facetious here, but I hope to has an aspect of agency to it, that you as the hoper have an active role to play. And Thomas Homer Dixon, who's a professor at, uh, he sometimes at the University of Waterloo and sometimes at Royal Roads University in Canada, he speaks about that difference, that hope can be very passive or hope can be very active. And making sure that when you are thinking in a hopeful way, that you are framing in that active mindset. I hope to become a good food scientist. I hope to learn food innovation, or I hope to become a product developer. Well, that then allows you to frame your motivation and set goals so that you can set an action pathway towards that hope. Versus hoping that, I hope that I become, it's passive. So be very cognizant of that aspect of hope in language. Something else that uh, Thomas Hom uh, Homer Dixon talks about is hope as an agency of change. And in, in his book, Commanding Hope, he speaks a lot about the principle of hope behind uh, Greta Thunberg. The photo that's in my presentation right now is of Greta Thunberg and her sign, School Strike for the Climate, that here is a young person with a hope. But that hope was not a passive hope. It was... Oh, act of hope that through that acts aspect of agency for change that aspect that hope can be part of what makes change that uh, uh, Thomas Homer Dixon describes it as a radical hope that here is a young person with a goal but at the same time that active aspect that Greta Thunberg was able to organize people around her who had very good communications capabilities, was able to communicate a very singular message, was able to communicate a hope that also had fear and pain in it. That hope is not, hope is not uh, again, that naive, uh, wishful thinking. Many of uh, Greta Thunberg's messages are very painful and very, uh, almost angry, but at the same time, driven by a hope that people can do better. There is that intrinsic aspect as well that everything that Greta Thunberg is doing has that singularity of purpose. That and we talk in in some of our other slideshows about 
motivation, if you can figure out what is driving your motivation, I want to be a really good product developer. I want to be a product developer in a chocolate bar factory. I want to be the, I don't know, uh, the minister of agriculture someday. I, I, I don't want to be the minister of agriculture, but I'm just throwing out some hopes and, and visions. You are then able to direct your activities, direct your action, direct your uh, direct your mind and principles towards that hope and and create the action around it so that that change can occur. Now, hope is not a guarantee. Hope is not going to guarantee that I am going to become the Minister of Agriculture someday or or that uh, that my spouse is going to give me a television for my birthday. But if I don't go and tell my spouse I would like a television for my birthday or that I don't go and communicate with I don't know, different product developers because I want to become a uh, product developer in a chocolate bar factory. That hope has to have those other allied activities to help you towards that singular goal. And so that uh, Thomas Homer Dixon writes quite extensively about that. And, and his book, uh, Commanding Hope, is it's a really interesting read. And there's a lot of um, public interest information about it um, in different podcasts as well. Reach out to me if you want to find more. Um, but one last topic that Thomas Homer Dixon talks about is that aspect of adjacent possibility that oftentimes we, we say to ourselves, well, I just can't do that. It's never been done that way. And, 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 and he asked that question, why do we set up those functional barriers in our mind? Why do we say, well, it can't be done? Why, uh, I was mentioning how I've been in this, in this working group with the Thought for Food uh, Foundation. Many of the people in there say, we can't change the governments. We can't change bureaucracy. And I'm like, why not? Have you tried? Well, it just can't be done. Well, have you tried? Um, that aspect of adjacent possibility is that we often, we often just turn down opportunities or turn down ideas because they've just never been done versus asking ourselves, why, why can't we? And why can't we put our energy into that? And investigating the possibility behind it. That adjacent possibility is an important part of Thomas Homer Dixon's uh, principle behind Commanding Hope, that we have to question, we have to consider why systems, and likewise, we have to expect that, uh, that systems are going to respond in kind, that if there is a true rationale why things aren't done a certain way, that they can come out and justify it, and that they can explain. Because if they can't explain, then perhaps that is a good catalyst for why things do need to change. So think about uh, think about some of those aspects of hope that it needs to be a really active and principled process. It's not a guarantee and it's not intended to be naive, but it's intended to be that driving motivation that moves change. Now, I mentioned how um, I had a lot of really great interaction with the Thought for Food uh, organization and many of the different thought leaders that have emerged through that. I was really lucky to be in a small group workshop with Christine Gould, the CEO, and she is the author of The Change Maker's Guide to Feeding the Planet. And this is actually a book that I want to uh, track down and see if it's worth bringing in as one of our one of our readings. But she talks about some of these mindsets that really create good innovation practices. And so one of them is the idea of openness, that you are open to embracing new ideas and diverse ideas. Uh, so new experiences, new ideas. I think about uh, one of my favorite experiences with a student years ago. This was a student who had who had autism and he came into the program and and he embraced this concept of new experiences and ideas. He had never eaten an orange before. And it was such an exciting day in that class because his what we call zone of proximal development said, hey, you know what? You've never eaten an orange. Let's try eating an orange together. Be open to new experiences and new ideas and diverse ideas as well. Uh, a lot of innovation comes from um, listening to others and listening to their worldviews to see what is possible and connecting those dots. We do talk uh, in, in this class, we have some more videos coming up that we talk about what the ideation process looks like, but we need to be open to new, uh, new experiences and ideas to be able to make those connections and then create breakthroughs that, that, that catalyze that innovation. Collaboration is the next skill set that she talks about, and that's the willingness to dive into possibilities. And now she talked a lot about the possibilities of digital technologies. And honestly, what's been so, so really neat about the COVID era is that 
many organizations before said, you know what, we can't do online stuff. We Online conferences, online classes, online this and that. It's just too hard. And then suddenly, a year and a half ago, everyone had to go online really, really fast. Now we are in that space where it's common and it's 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 there's still intricacies. I, I live in central Niagara and we didn't have high speed internet until recently. But it's 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 emerging for everyone that that aspect of digital connection is is a reality and we're finding all sorts of new tools to collaborate on anything anywhere at any time. I was so lucky it was my daughter's birthday and I had a big proposal and a conference call I had to take and my daughter said I'm a teenager, I don't want you to interfere in my birthday, but could you take me to the beach? And I said, yes, I can. I took my computer to the beach and I linked up to the Wi-Fi hotspot at the beach. And there I was taking my conference calls anywhere, anytime. And meanwhile, I'm working on a paper with colleagues in New York City and colleagues in Ireland and colleagues around the world at the exact same time as I'm sitting on the beach. That aspect of collaborating with anyone, anywhere, anytime really comes from that motivation. I want to work and I want to work hard and I want to serve the community. And so I was able to make it happen. And that that reality is becoming more and more emergent for more and more people. Having a beginner's mindset is another term that Christine Gould talks about. And that aspect of playfulness and curiosity and uh, not having a huge ego when going into building ideas is so important for her. That said, I want to counter it with respect for knowledge and experience. There are many I, are there are many times where I've worked with organizations and they've said, yeah, let's go in with a really strong beginner's mindset. Let's be curious and playful and come up with all sorts of ideas. And sometimes I walk in there as the, <laughs> pardon the language, an old and moldy PhD. And I'm like, this is how it is done. End of story. And they're like, but no, let's try all these. And I'm like, no, nope, just like, stop. Let, let's just do it this way. And, and sometimes... You want to go in with that curiosity and really stretch the ideas and uh, experiment and play around and be really open-minded. And other times, for the sake of efficiency, you want to have the, the, the word of knowledge come in and just say, okay, this is how it's going to get done. Let's get her done and let's move on. Uh, because sometimes the bigger goal is more important than that playing around. That, that it's a balancing act between the two because you do want to be creative and curious and have fun in, in your work. And uh, one way that I express that to the students who are new to the college, you may see that every once in a while I'll bring in uh, different uh, different uh, Playmobil characters to be the, I want to say the, the actors in some of the case studies because I can't talk about the real companies and I have to blind all of the information about the companies, but I, I bring out these little Playmobil guys and it's just so ridiculous that oftentimes the students say that big, huge number set and that big, huge mathematical challenge that you that you wanted us to do because you came at it with such a with such a lighthearted and fun approach. I was able to embrace it and learn better because it was you made it fun. And so that beginner's mindset is really important. Uh, next one is entrepreneurial methods. Even if you are not an entrepreneur, learning about entrepreneurship and how uh, entrepreneurs are open to opportunity in every challenge. This is something that's valuable in any organization. Honestly, even if you were to go and work for a big, huge bureaucratic organization, they need that aspect of entrepreneurship to be able to see an opportunity in a challenge and to turn that into then into an action pathway, turn that into a project and turning it into a result. It's it's easier than ever, and there's so many tools available. And we'll, uh, we'll spend time in the innovation class together, walking through many of those different tools to evaluate opportunities. And uh, sheer purpose. Um, in many of my videos, I talk about uh, W. Edwards Deming, and um, he was a he was a statistician and organizational theorist, actually from the 1950s. But he talked a lot about unified vision and and shared purpose. But that aspect of having a united cause within your organization is really, really important. And then to use a variety of different emotional intelligences to be able to capture that shared purpose. Collaboration's hard and it's, it's so difficult. And despite all of these wonderful tools to think that everyone has the capability of collaborating, it's an iterative process. Sometimes you have to go back to the beginning again to make sure that 
people are in that shared purpose. But when you have that shared unified vision and it's clearly communicated to everyone, it's easy to be able to organize people behind that and rally support and motivate people to work towards that shared purpose. That's another one. And um, nurturing communities, this, this is one that I resonate quite well with in that oftentimes at Niagara College, we talk a lot about the importance of community, that your first community is your classmates, then your professors, and then many of the guests that we bring into the college because they're committed to be there and they want to be there and they want to share information with you. They want to be your community. Then finding organizations that might be helpful to you. There's a, a wide number of different uh, um, trade organizations that relate to different commodity groups or relate to different professional development dimensions. And we encourage our students to join many of those nurturing communities. But having that aspect of relationship, knowing that despite, despite all of the good learning that you might do, you, there's no way that you can know everything, but if you have a good community around you, you can quickly find the people who do know what you need to know to help you propel you forward during those challenges and help you connect the dots for those opportunities because they may have skills that you need or connections that you need. And when you're fostering good relationships, that really, really helps um, streamline that entire process. And so another, another uh, if I can use the term guru that I often mention is uh, Marshall Gantz. This is a photo of Marshall Gantz. And Marshall Gantz uh, is a professor at Harvard University. And he talks a lot about the aspect of community organizing and grassroots organizing. But the idea that he uses is used by major governments and major organizations at the same time. The idea being that you have to be an effective communicator and you have to be willing to go out there. If you want to innovate and you want to change things, you've got to have commitment, courage and imagination and a dedication to learning. And so again, I love this quote because that's why you're here. You're dedicated to learning and you're dedicated to change. You're changing yourself first and then you can change systems around you as you go through that. So, you know, my motto, if you have questions, you can reach out anytime. Um, I try my best to respond to all sorts of questions from all over the world, and especially my own students. And be, uh, be courageous in your learning process. Keep, keep on learning and keep on joining us for more videos. I am so excited to be back with you and we'll have more fun together very, very soon. Take care and we'll talk to you soon.